taking all of those abstract zoning bylaws, built form guidelines, and doing feasibility studies, highest and best use type analysis. And I would do this hundreds or thousands of times. I got pretty good at it. I set up systems, made this as efficient as possible for my clients. Um, but what I was doing was essentially taking complex rules, so whether it's you know zoning, the official plans, secondary plans, provincial growth targets, whatever that information was, you know the built form guidelines here in Toronto, mid-rise guidelines, um, and translating that and optimizing for density. And so like, like we heard in the last talk, you know, there was, there was a couple of uh, axes that these things were evaluated on and I recognized that, you know, at a certain point, you know, computers are really good at this kind of thing. And so I was describing the sort of work that I was doing um, and laughing that it was actually mathematical optimization. And, you know, my, my co a group of colleagues, because uh, uh, architects only hang out with other architects, uh, over brunch I was describing the mathematical optimization that I was doing. Um, and my colleague Aaron thought this was a really interesting technical challenge. So his background was a little bit different. Um, he had actually been working for a global engineering firm developing crowd simulation software for them. So he worked with Arup engineers and developed their mass motion platform. Um, and so his software would allow you to bring in your design for whether it's a, an airport or a stadium or a train station and then analyze how thousands of people can move through the space. So he brought a really deep experience in high powered computational geometry. Um, and so we started talking about this idea of how could we create a technology to help understand how cities grow, bring data about cities into one place, and help those you know, professional city builders out there give, give them new tools to use to optimize for density to bring more housing and office space to market faster. So over the course, the course of a few months, this became um, less and less of a crazy idea. And so Aaron took a leave of absence from his job just over two summers ago. And uh, he built our first minimum viable product, MVP for short in the uh, tech startup lingo. Uh, and he came back from his leave of absence, went back to his, his real nine to five job. And I started taking this MVP around to, to my clients, the clients that I was working, that I was doing consulting work with. One of the other early pieces of advice that we got as we were you know, talking about this wacky idea that came up over brunch was, if we wanted to do this, we had to run this like a tech company, not like a software company, or not like a um, architecture company. Again, I always knew I was gonna grow up and be an architect. I knew how to be, in a, how to run an architecture firm, but what does it mean to run a tech startup? And so at the same time as Aaron was building our MVP, I was going around and participating in a lot of the early stage tech startup space here in Toronto. And so there are a number of resources. Again, Toronto is really focused on becoming a hub for, for incubating early stage companies. And so we participated in a number of these, um, these groups, the events that they had. And it sort of culminated in a, in a pitch competition. So, you know, kind of like Dragon's Den, but in Waterloo and live um, for early stage tech startups. And uh, I won. And so as a result of winning this pitch competition, you know, beating out 20 other uh, early stage companies from various verticals in different, in, in different industries. Um, we won up some prize money, and that was enough for Aaron to quit his job, for myself to give up my consulting work, and for us to make our first hire. So again, this was just spring of last year. And so we took that prize money, and the three of us got a product to market in summer of last year. So we're just over a year since we launched here in Toronto, and um, next I'm going to sort of talk about, you know, how what we're building ties into that little spiel about uh, how cities grow and change. Um, and we really see ourselves at the intersection of all of these, of, the, of these forces. The power structures, again, the rules and regulations that we all have to operate within, the economics, what makes a certain site feasible or not, and then the vision. What kind of city do you want to live in? So what we're doing is we are aggregating data from various sources. And as a starting point, we're looking at all of those municipal rules and regulations. And so the zoning, the official plan, the secondary plans. Uh, I'll go through a bit of a recorded demo here and try to uh, talk over it as it runs. So we've got a web-based interface. So essentially, you can access this through any browser. You don't need to install anything. You don't have to worry about downloading the latest updates. It's always live. It's always current. 
Um, and you can see a 3D model of the city spin it around in, really t in real time. It's really lightweight and super fast. On top of that, we added the zoning bylaw. And so the red is your mixed use areas. And by clicking on any site, you can get a pop-up of additional detail. And then we'll take you right to the source document. So in this case, the city's zoning bylaw, which is online. In addition to, to the zoning, what we did was we took the allowable heights under the current zoning bylaw here in Toronto. Um, and the way that zoning works in the provinces of Ontario is that it is a negotiated process. The city's as of right zoning height says near College Park, you're allowed to build, build 61 meters in height. All the buildings around there are much taller than that. But again, anybody who's been building these buildings understands that you're going to be rezoning the site. You're going to be asking the city to amend the zoning bylaw. So again, it's a complex negotiation. Uh, and so our tools sort of fit within this because what's more important than the current zoning is all the other planning policies. And so we're bringing in the official plan. And again, the secondary plans. And so if you are looking at a site in the east end of the city near King Parliament, we will take you right to the King Parliament secondary plan so that if you, you, know, you can read through and figure out what the urban objectives that the city is trying to achieve in this neighborhood. Um, TO Core has been in the news a lot recently if you've been following provincial politics. Uh, and so again, we've got those layers. We've got all the amendments to the official plan, the uh, site and area specific policies. The city wants to see mid-rise developments and so we've got all the avenues, um, the widths of the rights of way which start speaking to built form because the wider the street, the taller your podium det determines where your angular plane comes off. We all want to see uh, densification near our transit node nodes. So we've got the existing subway stations and 500 meter walking circles around all of them. We've got the go lines, the major rail corridors, the, the um, Eglinton line under construction. We've got the proposed downtown relief line, Ontario line, whatever we're calling it these days. So again, if you're looking at any sites, you can see what the impact of all of these policies could be on the site that you're looking at. Um, Heritage, we'll uh, just touch on briefly. So we've got a number of heritage conservation districts, so we've got all of those mapped. And then we've also got the entire database of every single listed and designated buildings in the city uploaded. And when you hover over any one of those dots, you can get a pop-up to get you more detail about why that specific building was listed. Now, I spoke briefly about the, the process of rezoning a property. And so, because this is a complex negotiation, oh, sorry, I'm getting distracted and getting ahead of myself. So what we can do is, you know, different policies from different sources. So whether it's the provincial urban growth centers, whether it's the ravines, we can now see all of this information together in one place. We should be able to go to the development applications next. Uh, okay, so we can now see how those various policies combine. So the province says they want to see densification in these areas near transit, and they make it very difficult to amend a secondary plan. So now we can see, you know, these various policies all overlaid in one space. Now, there we go. Now, so we talked about that uh, amendment process. So we've also built a scraper that looks at the City of Toronto's database of every single development application that is currently active in the City of Toronto. And then we've geolocated them, categorized them by status, and extruded them in three dimensions so that you can actually see this is all the activity that's going on. And by clicking on any one of these colored areas, you can get a pop-up to see what's under construction, what's been appro uh, approved, what's been appealed to the OMB, and every single one of these will take you back to the city database so you can be sure you're always getting the most current information. And from there you can download whether it's the architectural plans or the planning rationale or the wind studies that were submitted. So again, we're aggregating the data and we're linking you right back to the city's website. In addition to the planning uh, regulations, we've also got committee of adjustments. And then once a project has gone through that process and they have a site-specific zoning bylaw in place, we also have a layer for that and we'll take you right back to that approved zoning bylaw. 
So I'm not sure if there's many planners in the room, but this, all this research does take a significant amount of time. And so the fact that we've got now a web-based interface that you can just go online and see all of this in a couple of seconds is remarkably time-saving. Time, time so the next thing is, underneath all of this, we've got a search, or we've got a database of every single property in the city that we can now search. Um, and so, in the same way, if you think about planning your next trip to Paris and you want to find a two-bedroom Airbnb close to the Eiffel Tower, if we wanted to find a site that was in this neighborhood that was mixed use, so that essentially was one of those CR or CRE zoning designations, that was underutilized, that was vacant to our parking lot, we can now filter search the entire city to find sites that are appropriate for densification. And then when we think back about all those other layers that I just went through, so if you had a mandate, for example, to find you know, a student housing site that was you know, close to a subway station that had a you know, two or three story building on it that had a minimum size of at least 15,000 square feet, we can now identify those kinds of opportunities across the entire city. And so what we did was we used all of this information and we kind of did a, a quick developability score, if you will, um, where we took three main criteria. You had to be close to transit, you need to have an op official plan designation of mixed use or regeneration or apartment. Um, and you had to be in one of those provincially mandated growth zones. And we scored every single property parcel within the city of Toronto based on those three criteria. Dark blue, you get three out of three. Medium blue, two out of three. Light blue, one out of three. And when you add up all of that land area, it's actually only 12% of the land area of the city of Toronto. So if we've got if we're expecting to grow by 100,000 people in the next few years, the question is how are we going to house them all on only 12% of our land area? So our, again, to, to, we, we looked at the existing infrastructure, so the transit. If we were able to change the zoning and the official plan on land that's adjacent to our existing infrastructure, those yellow circles, we could bring an extra 6% land area online. That's a 50% increase. So. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. And then the last part is, okay, so what do we do with all this information? So how do we combine all this knowledge that we've got about the planning regulatory framework with the economic feasibility of any site and the vision? Uh, so we've got some 3D scenario modeling tool. Again, everything is web-based. You don't need to download anything. Um, it's parametric, and so I'll show you how that, how that works next. All right, so here we go. So you select a site. And you can either type in an address or click on it in, in the window. Um, and what you instantly get is a summary of all those planning policies on the right-hand side. So what, what the existing zoning is, what the existing official plan designation is, if it's part of a heritage district, if it's how close it is to transit. Um, in this case, this one's under a hospital flight path, and so you need to be aware of that. So again, that all instantly comes up. You can generate a quick we're one page report, a summary report, easy to take to a meeting or email to a client. Gives you a snapshot of the zoning bylaw and a snapshot of the official plan so you can see your adjacencies. So it's kind of like having an urban planner in your pocket, essentially. We can also then really quickly see what else is happening in that area. What are the adjacencies? So in this case, there are 34 active development applications within a 500 meter, meter radius of this site. And so here's a list of all of those other projects and with links back to the city database. We can generate a report and instantly get a, a quick key plan to see where they're all located. And we're starting to graph them uh, in terms of the number of stories being applied for and the proximity to the site in question. And so by hovering over these bars, you can see, you know, this project's been approved, this one's been applied for, this one's at the OMB. Uh, and you can start seeing patterns. And so we're grouping it by status. So what's been applied for, what's under construction, what's been recently completed. Uh, anybody who goes to meetings with city councillors on this kind of thing, this is all of the development applications in Ward 13. And so when you meet with a councillor, this is everything that they're dealing with. Uh, and so this is the number of stories. And we can start calculating averages and, and, and finding patterns within all this data, which is currently, frankly, very, very opaque. Um, and we're starting to build a timeline. We started building this database about six months ago. 
but this process takes years. And so going forward, we'll be able to track how long it takes projects to go from initial application to, to city council, to, uh, to approval or appeal, and through construction. But what does all this mean? Uh, again, my background is architecture. I always just wanted to build stuff. Um, and so the final bit of the demo here is, you know, bringing in some straightforward parametric design in a web-based platform to allow our users to bring in those built form guidelines. So in the city of Toronto, again, you're gonna be amending the zoning bylaw, but the city has tall buildings guidelines that outline the rules of thumb that they wanna see for projects and mid-rise guidelines. And so what we've done is we've created a series of inputs that you can customize on the left-hand side and output a tall building on a podium. And so in this case, you know, we're dropping in a podium. We know the width of the right of way that this building is on, so the podium automatically sets itself to that height. Um, we know the as of right height, uh, but we can override that. So instead of 14 stories, we made it 40 stories. And what we're getting on the right is all of your totals. So your gross construction area, your gross floor area, approximate number of units based on a average unit size, approximate number of parking levels that you'll need based on a parking ratio. And so you can very, very quickly see, you know, what does 7.4 times density look like on this site? Uh, and again, everything is customizable because there are no correct answers in real estate. You know, each site is unique and will have different conditions, and so everything is customizable. Now, we're in Ward 13. There's a number of city parks nearby, and the councillor's really concerned about her making sure that, you know, the city parks are protected. So we've also got the ability to generate instant shadow studies so we can see how long a shadow this 40-story building casts. And when the shadow touches a park, it turns red. Warning. Uh, and so we can really, like before we've got a building design, we can know what our constraints are on the site. And so if we know that, you know, this shadow on Moss Park at five o'clock on March 21st is gonna be an issue, then maybe it's a 30-story building. Maybe it's not a 40-story building, maybe it's a 30-story building. And that's going to, again, reduce my density, reduce my unit count, and reduce my, my land value. Uh, and so essentially what we're really excited to do is to give, you know, everybody who's involved in building cities easy access to these kinds of tools. Um, we can also do incremental shadows, so you can turn on the adjacent neighborhoods and just do hour by hour shadows as well as the sweep over the course of the day. And in addition to the tall buildings, we can also do mid-rise guidelines, or as I like to call them, the, the ziggurats. Um, and so again, the city's mid-rise guidelines, you know, specify rules that are based on the width of the right of way that you're on. Again, we know that, so we can start an angular plane at 45 degrees, you know, starting at 80% of the width of the right of way, and then we can customize all of that as well. So we're really excited to be building tools at the intersection of all of these players within the city building space. Um, you know, working with our first customers were actually architects and urban planners who recognized that there was significant time saving for their staff to use this as a bu like business development tool, essentially, to be able to turn around these massing and feasibility studies much, much quicker, and to be able to have this information on the fly so that in a meeting, when somebody asks you a question, you've got all the answers right there. Um, real estate developers who have their planning teams and their development managers who are all constantly evaluating sites, but they don't know whether it's worth actually even going to the next step so they can run various scenario modeling themselves. And then looking at government agencies, the ones that are creating all of these policies that then determine where densification is going to go and that are evaluating our applications as they come through their, uh, through their desks. And again, you know, help, hopefully helping expedite this process to ultimately be able to get more housing and office to market. Um, yeah, so sort of in, in conclusion, that's, that's been the story of, of Ratio City to this point. We are very early stage. Um, our team has recently grown quite significantly, so we're very excited to be expanding our reach across the GTHA, um, and hopefully within the next 12 months be looking at going to Vancouver and Montreal and Seattle and Miami and other urban markets across North America that have similar conditions to Toronto in that there's lots of people that want to live and work here. There's a low vacancy rate. There's a very active construction market. Um, and so we're hoping that our tools will again bring value and ultimately help professional city builders access information and evaluate options and make better decisions to build better cities for all of us. <laughs>